So it's a real pleasure to be presenting to this symposium uh, my talk on new generation long axial field of view PET scanners, opportunities and challenges. Thank you very much for having me. I want to start by acknowledging two colleagues uh, with whom I've had extensive discussions and benefited from a number of their slides in this talk. Um, so with new technology, new applications arise, and this is something we've experienced, new opportunities, new ways to daydream and to think about doing things differently. You know, uh, a, a, a number of you would recall that, you know, decades ago, we were um, dealing with SEPTA on a regular basis. So inserting SEPTA between detectors in a PET scanner. Of course, you know, this is an exaggerated drawing uh, where we're only showing three detectors. Obviously, we'll be having many, many, many rings, actual rings. Um, and the sort of the reflection or thought was, if we get rid of the SIPTA, obviously, we're going to improve the sensitivity of the scanner. But then we're going to have to deal with the computational demand, greater storage. Um, you know, how are we going to handle the additional scattered events and random coincidences, but we dealt with it, right? And so this is the septalest pet is now a clinical reality um, and has certainly uh, made uh, performance of pet imaging um, uh, improve. And this is again, a, a combination of this happened as a combination of uh, thinking differently of having uh, advanced, more advanced electronics, image reconstruction algorithms, et cetera, right? So we've gone from this paradigm to a paradigm like that of significantly improved uh, sensitivity. And then, you know, time of flight has been thought about for decades now, increasingly utilized. Um, and so instead of sort of back projecting a line of response in its entirety, we can localize a line of response to, um, to, to a part of it so we can um, remove, you know, prop or reduce propagation of noise and get, you know, added performance. So, you know, so again, this kind of an idea has had repercussions, has, has resulted in uh, uh, across the board agreement that it, it, it improves uh, image quality and quantitative accuracy. And of course, these numbers have now significantly improved and they're continuing to improve to 200 picoseconds and below that. Um, so now we're talking about um, long axial field of view PET scanners. Historically, again, this is an idea that great thinkers have, have thought about. Um, in this example, notably, we would mention Dr. Simon Chair and Dr. Ramsey Battery, who tried very hard over the years to get funded to initiate the Explorer project, for example, um, as a consequence of that funding you know, and, and then uh, with, with the UPenn folks and, uh, you know, brilliant thinkers uh, coming up with the idea and implementing the idea of extending the field of view from only, say, 15, 20, 25 centimeters to um, up to even a two meter PET scanner. This resulted in the now FDA approved United Imaging product, which, which is transforming the field. So the Penn PET Explorer, of course, um, has has, is also a work in progress, you know, starting with 60 to 70 centimeters, maybe being extended to over a meter, 120 centimeters here. And we have the Siemens uh, uh, Biograph Vision Quadra is another example, looking at about a meter uh, long axial field of view. So we are contemplating, you know, what are the implications of these? But before that, let's talk about this a little bit more. So, you know, wh why do we get uh, what, what do we get with these scanners? Well, we get significantly improved effective sensitivity. And that's really a, a, a consequence of, of two things. One is that, um, you know, for a given spot, you're having many, many, many more detectors and lines of response crossing that point and that, let's say, an organ of interest. So you're getting added uh, efficiency uh, in detection, but also you're covering more of the body, right? So so it's a combination of, of, of these two factors. So you could do you know, single bed or two bed imaging instead of doing six, seven beds to cover the whole, whole body, for example, right? Um, so um, so if, if you're contemplating an adult and you're having a really long axial field of view, two meter long axial field of view, such as you know, specifically with the U, the U Explorer by United Imaging, 
you know, the numbers that are being reported are definitely an order of magnitude here, you know, a factor of 40 improvement compared to some kind of a conventional um, scanner. Pediatric, that's less, right? Because uh, of the second contribution is less as, as we discussed above. And if you're just thinking about a single organ, you know, we're looking at a factor of five. Um, so the, the value of this, of course, becomes more when you're looking at, uh, you know, a tall patient or, or an adult patient. And there's definitely added value for pediatric, single organ too, um, but you can sort of see this. Um, and so, and I will come back to this because these numbers are relative to which scanner you're thinking about. Plus this number does not take into account whether time of flight is implemented or not, right? So with the Siemens, for example, the time of flight is, is very, very good. And time of flight, um, even though not implemented within the assessment of sensitivity, but effectively it really, really uh, has an impact uh, uh, on the quality of the images. So, so, you know, give or take, we're talking about an order of magnitude enhancement in the sensitivity. Um, and again, I know there are, there are differences about how to calculate this, but let's just go with this sort of a rough outline and move forward. So cost has been obviously one of the uh, issues that, that has been often talked about. Um, and, you know, this is because you, especially because you're having a, a, lot, a lot more detector material, um, you know, cost saving has been proposed, such as the idea of maybe spacing the detector rings, right? So this is something that uh, our other speaker, Dr. Karakatsanis may, 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 you know, has, he's investigated, you know, alternate scenarios as an example, he may talk about that. Um, and the point is that even though you might be using, let's say, tenfold number of detectors, that doesn't mean you're getting a tenfold increase in detector costs, right? Um, uh, but still, uh, there is a significant added cost to purchase a single long axial field of view scanner compared to a conventional PET scan. Um, but however, I really want to emphasize that there is yet, you know, we, we are still to take that path from an invention to innovation, and that is being taken. And we are hearing the symposium thinking about this. Uh, before we can really comment on the cost effectiveness of, of this technology. Um, so I really want to contextualize my discussions about the possibilities with long actual field of view scanners in the context of this, um, this, this drawing here. And I especially want to refer you to this, uh, 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 these two articles in, in PET clinics by my great colleague, Dr. Bob Sabri of NIH. Um, and so if you think about the signal to noise ratios, you know, the performance of the image in a physical sense, we're gonna to refer to SNR biological later, but in a physical SNR, it's gonna be related give or take to this kind of a formula where we're having sensitivity of the scanner, the radioactivity at the time of imaging and the duration of the scan, right? So you can imagine if this number S is being increased by an order of magnitude, right? By a factor of, 10, 40, you know, depending on what the scanner is doing and which scanner we're talking about and how we're making this measurement. But let's say an order of magnitude uh, improvement in this number S, well, then for keeping these A and T the same and constant, you're gonna get significantly improved image uh, signal to noise ratios, right? And, and alternatively, if, if you keep this, if you wanna keep this number constant, right? Um, well, then you can actually lower the, this A, resulting in lower injected dose or, or enabling delayed imaging, or you can uh, lower this T, allowing better temporal resolution. So let's talk about each of these. So let's first talk about this, improving image quality. Um, so, you know, detection power is increased. You know, you, you might be able to achieve very good because you're having, um, you could be using, you know, finer pixels and voxels, you know, such as in this example. Um, to get very good images, um, you, you can take advantage of this improved contrast resolution to, to allow molecular imaging clinicians to look at things that were unseeable before, right? And so one example I really have in mind here, and, 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 and I believe will be explored extensively, uh, is combining long axial field of view PET scanners with AI techniques to allow us to, to obtain um, you know, exquisite resolution and detection performance to look at screening, right? So PET as a screening application has often been thought to be um, uh, expensive, um, but looking at this modality and having super low doses with super quick uh, imaging 
we might be able to look at a renewed, we might be having renewed interest in screen applications of head imaging, such as lung screening, for example, lung cancer screening. So let's look at this example where we can significantly lower the injected dose. And so, you know, for example, there's been a report with the total body PET scanner of, for example, injecting a patient only 0.7 millicuries, 25 megabecquerels, you know, getting reasonable images at reasonable time. Um, so this is a new possibility, right? So again, this links, by the way, with the screening application that I mentioned before as well. Um, so this could really also enable immunopet um, because, for example, a challenge with the chronic A9 agents has been that um, you know, the high, high radiation uh, dose per scan has been forcing us to, to lower how much we can inject. Uh, given the long half-life, for example, and the high uh, gamma emission, and a typical imaging dose that has been acceptable, giving us acceptable image quality in the past has, has cost about 20 to 50 millisieverts. But with, uh, with, um, with long axial field of view PET scanners, we could be looking at doses of the order of millisieverts only, around one millisievert, give or take, right? And, and we could be uh, getting very good image qualities. Delayed imaging. So the time interval between the injection of the radio tracer and initiation of the imaging, that, you know, playing with that could, could have implications. So if you're increasing that delay, you know, time delay until you actually do, do acquisition of images, you allow the uh, radio tracer to accumulate in the region of interest over time because of the signal enhancement that happens in, in the tracer pharmacokinetics and also the washing out of the off-target activity from the background, so the noise reduction that would happen. Um, and so by increasing this time interval, you're increasing the signal to noise ratio in a biological sense. So allowing delayed imaging enhances the signal to noise rate ratios biologically, and that, that has significant implications. So this kind of a paradigm, which is not routinely explored, but definitely has been researched and, and has been you know, implemented in some centers, uh, but remains to be widely deployed, you know, uh, applies to, you know, again, can enable clinical utility for different applications like atherosclerosis detection and quantification, which I'll talk about a little bit more later, you know, novel brain imaging applications. Um, so, and again, the problem is that in conventional PET scanners, these kind of imagings with delayed imaging are prone to error and suboptimal performance if the imaging activity is lower than expected. So again, with delayed imaging, you might be able to delay even FTG for say eight hours or more, depending, depending on the scanner. And that itself enables interesting applications. And remember the biological signal is being enhanced at least to a certain point and new applications can arise that others have really extensively talked about. And so you could look at improved signal neural issues in lymph nodes and in small organs like the liver, for example, and, you know, and, and smaller organs. Uh, looking at um, looking at uh, this gain signal to noise ratio biologically uh, can also uh, enable antibody based radio tracers um, to be imaged. So again, we talked about this example here, uh, where you could actually even image a, a patient up to many many days uh, post injection. Uh, so here's just an example. Um, so we're looking at a patient with conventional imaging. Um, and so what we're having here is looking at the, for example, the lymph node, uh, and we're having the perihepatic disease. And when we instead wait and do delayed imaging, so this is with the, uh, uh, this is with the pen PET scanner. When the, the uh, delaying is done at 2.75 hours, this is the kind of image you get, four hours is what you get. And this is post therapy, right? So, so to monitor what is happening. Um, so so this, this kind of a, image quality would have been missed had we done conventional image, right? So, so this is fantastic work by our colleagues on the UPenn scanner um, uh, at, at UPenn, on the pen PET scanner at UPenn. So, um, and finally, um, let's talk about a little bit more about uh, better uh, temporal resolution. Um, so this itself has implications, can shorten the study time so a single, you know, static PET imaging, conventional PET imaging, like your SUV kind of PET imaging can be performed in, in shorter duration of time. And so this has implications for reduction in cases where sedation is required. 
um, risk complexity costs, economic advantages, in, in increasing scanner throughput, um, and reducing motion artifacts. Let's talk about this next. But then after that, I'll talk about the applications of dynamic imaging. So shortening the study time, again, um, conventional PET scan may take 10, 15, 20 minutes. Uh, nowadays, but we could go down to about a minute, right? Or even less, depending on the scanner and, and how we're thinking about it. Um, so shortening this significantly has implications, as we talked about. And um, for example, patients with difficulty tolerating longer scans, they could be imaged more readily. Um, and so, you know, with appropriate coaching without the need for sedation or anesthesia, right? Um, and so entire scan time could be decreased to even, you know, less than five minutes, you know, total. So one could be blocking 15 minute time intervals for let's say up to many, many examinations for a, you know, long working day, similar to what is done in CT. So the throughput, um, right? So, so we already talked about that. Um, as far as dynamic imaging goes, well, if, if you can acquire a really good image in a very short time interval, then you can acquire multiple of them. And so in a relatively short, inter short interval, you can get many um, temporally acquired PET scans. And so that allows you to monitor how the radio tracer or the pharmaceutical is, is changing over time. So you could get exquisite performance. This is an example for a total body PET scanner, uh, where again, you can sort of see that the temporal resolution has become something that was unimaginable in the past. Um, so combined dynamic imaging with kinetic modeling is a very important paradigm. I think of it as an image reconstruction problem. So not the usual image recon, because usual image recon, you have the measured data sets on a PET scanner. And by knowledge of the physics of the system, you can reconstruct the image. But this one is, we're measuring radio dis you know, distribution of the radio pharmaceutical in the body, which is the reconstructed set of images. We have some measure of the what's going into the body, meaning how the radio pharmaceutical is distributing in the, in the body, in the, in the blood, in the plasma. It has been com conventionally done using, could have been invasive you know, blood sampling, but if you're doing total body, whole body imaging, you, you, you have a lot of access to blood pools, the heart you know, and other blood pools in the body, ascending, descending, aorta, et cetera. So you could make this non-invasive. And so by knowledge of this and that, you can, estimate, reconstruct, you know, using kinetic modeling or mathematical biology, um, the subject physiology. And I'm gonna emphasize that long actual field of view PET scanner allows us to do better mathematical biology beyond our oversimplified kinetic models that we're having right now. But the point is kinetic modeling has sort of made it to some clinical applications, especially in cardiac imaging, right? So you might have a certain kinetic model um, and, um, I'm sure Dr. Global Wang amongst the speakers will talk about kinetic modeling extensively, uh, but I'm just gonna briefly touch upon this. So, you know, you're generating, you know, bullseye images that are not just conventional cardiac images, but you're looking at quantitative measurements using kinetic modeling. And so many different applications are out there that are doing this and some clinical centers are deploying this routinely. But what is this done in, 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 in cancer? Not so much, not routinely. Okay, with, with the exception of some centers, such as, uh, such as your, your, your respectable uh, pet center in Heidelberg, but um, in, in, um, in many sites, you know, this is not even used in a research setting. And there, even though th this makes a lot of sense, and Dr. Karakatsanis will, will talk about this more today, um, but the problem has been that even though it makes sense to do kinetic modeling for FDG, because uh, you know there's a change in the uptake and by studying the change in the uptake instead of just doing a single snapshot imaging, imaging at 60 minutes post injection we might get more information but people have often thought well you either do whole body imaging static or you do single body imaging dynamic right but not the two but you know we've tried to counter that right so Dr. Karakatsanis himself is a pioneer in this field of suggesting that even with conventional PET scanners we could do dynamic whole body imaging. I'm sure he's gonna talk about that in detail. So why not do dynamic whole body imaging? But the beauty of long axial field of view PET scanners is that this becomes even more natural. So in the case of a extreme, you know, total body PET scanner, a single bed is a whole body. So, so 
single bed dynamic imaging is whole body dynamic imaging. In the case of scanners that are shorter still, it's very natural. And in fact, conventionally, some of the studies did that. Like they had two beds, conventional PET scanners, two beds covering only part of the body and doing dynamic imaging moving up and down between the two beds. Well, now with, with a one meter long PET scanner, you could cover the whole body, let's say with two bed uh, positions and you could move up and down um, and do dynamic, or even just use that one meter over the most important part of the body. And one meter is long, right? It's gonna cover a lot of vital organs and you could just do dynamic imaging. So dynamic whole body, you know, semi whole body imaging is readily enabled. So we've kind of reviewed the literature here and you can refer to this. And again, I wanna emphasize with long axial field of view, dynamic whole body pet imaging becomes even more natural, okay? So, and there are many different applications that you can think about in cancer, inflammation, infection, looking at systemic disease, um, and just improved quantitative performance beyond SUV, beyond standard optic values, looking at kinetic, physiologically meaningful parameters and looking at how different radiopharmaceuticals behave and looking at different axes in the body, the gut brain axis, heart brain, heart brain axis, how the different organs interact together. Um, and I wanna emphasize that we can move towards parametric imaging, whole body parametric imaging. So this is a review article that Recently, uh, we wrote Dr. Guava Wang, who is one of the great speakers today in the lineup, uh, along with uh, Dr. Roger Gunn, we wrote this. And we're kind of looking at the, what's been happening in parametric imaging. And you know, with, with, with this technology, we could do parametric imaging more readily, whole body parametric imaging. And so you can refer to that. And there, there's a number of software packages that are out there. And it's interesting, and this is a table that we have in that paper. One of the interesting trends is that many of these software packages enable parametric imaging. So people have often thought very actively about not just doing kinetic modeling for a whole organ, but looking at individual pixels. What's that physiolo physiological parameter for this pixel, for this pixel, for this pixel? So creating an image of physiologically meaningful parameters. So the, so the software capabilities are out there. Many different software packages can do this, but to actually deploy this routinely in the clinic, there remains work to be done, and again, Long axial field view PET scanners can, can help in that direction. So we can have a vision of the future where instead of doing just a static SUV image, you do dynamic imaging and from the dynamic PET images, you could do, for example, the pat like slope, the pat like intercept and the SUV by just summing those dynamic frames. And for a single PET scan, you get three images and you can fuse them instead of just one image. Okay, so, um, and, and of course, there was a software release about this few years ago. And I think whole body dynamic PET is for research only. The answer is supposed to be no, we can use this clinically. But again, this remains to be deployed and, and, and experimented with. And again, with total body or with long axial field of view PET scanners, such as this beautiful video uh, uh, from the Explorer, uh, you sort of can get again, exquisite information from dynamic images uh, for the first time in this long actual field of view acquired over time. So enab enabling us to do very interesting um, studies. Um, yeah, so, and you could also do more advanced kinetic modeling. You don't have to get stuck with PATLAC. You could move beyond macro kinetic parameters as in PATLAC and do micro kinetic parameters. I'm sure Dr. Guava Wang will talk about that. And other applications to like, We've thrown the idea of black blood PET for a while now. You know, it remains to be really worked on and experimented. And, um, and so, so you, what, it, what on earth is this? Well, black blood MRI is a thing. So black blood MRI is when you use uh, MR protocols to suppress the signal from the blood. Where technically, when you think about it, when you do kinetic modeling, we can suppress the signal from the blood. So let's think of imaging atherosclerotic plaques, and you know, there are applications of this with FDG, where you're uh, studying you know, uptake in the carotid artery, for example, following some kind of diet change uh, or some kind of therapy, right? So, so you're doing this kind of work and often you're waiting for a couple of hours before you scan so that the signal in the blood has been suppressed. Well, technically, if you do even simple PAT-like imaging, which is showing the rate of FDG uptake, well, that, when you're looking at the rate of FTG uptake uh, in the vessel walls, that is already supposed to be suppressing 
FDG that has not been phosphorylated, FDG that is in the background or in the blood pool. Okay, so it's supposed to do that. So we had some evidence about this, remains to be explored, you know, uh, motion is something to be thought about here, you know, as we do dynamic acquisition, how motion enters the picture. But this is conventional imaging where you get the FDG in the blood pool at early times. But similarly, at early times doing dynamic imaging allows you to suppress signal uh, at the blood pool and look at the walls better, possibly, right? So this is something possibly to be explored more. Okay, so I also want to talk about a different direction that we can pursue. And I think this is one of the major themes of the future, I believe it might be, I hope it is, you know, this is what we're thinking about. So predictive dosimetry. And so, so to contextualize that, let's talk about theranostics, right? So, so this, this very important paradigm that, that um, many, many of you are very familiar with that when you have a radio pharmaceutical and you have theranostic pairs where you have a radio pharmaceutical that binds to a certain let's say protein expressed by a certain cancer cell that has been labeled by, uh, let's say fluorine 18 that emits light, gamma rays to do imaging. But instead, if you label it with something else, let's say with lutetium 177, then you're getting a uh, therapy paradigm where instead of emitting light, you're emitting beta rays, right? Electrons or alpha, right? So, so you can, you, you, you see what you treat and you treat what you see or the other way around, you treat what you see, you first see it, then you treat what you're seeing. And then after the therapy, you come back and see what you've treated, right? So it's very important, pharmaceutical, thera radio pharmaceutical therapy, many different names for it, as you know, radionuclide therapy, molecular radiotherapy, but the paradigm is nearly the same between these different labels. So, you, so it's beyond the conventional radiotherapy scheme, it's molecular radiotherapy, where instead of where the, the, the light is not coming externally, but it's coming internally, um, right? So, so the targeting is happening from, from inside. Um, and so one example is the vision trial with PSMA, with prostate specific membrane antigen that has created a lot of excitement in, in treating prostate cancer. This was a recent study that was published, many, many, many different sites showing a lot of excitement, but I wanna emphasize, these therapies were not personalized. So we're giving the same, nearly the same dose to all patients. And still with that, we're getting about a five month uh, improvement uh, in uh, four, so four month improvement in overall survival, going from 11 months to 15 months, you know, compared to standard of care when you're combining standard of care with PSMA therapy and progression free survival is improving by five months. So you're getting these kind of curves, but these are not personalized, right? So we need to be doing the symmetry to understand how much dose is being delivered to these patients. But if we can use the PET scan acquired prior to therapy and use that to predict what will be the uptake, which is a difficult task, then we're doing predictive dose symmetry. So this is a paradigm we can think about. And to do that, we believe we need to be building digital twins. So a digital twin is a numeric representation of a patient spanning one's entire life, and it can be constantly updated, right? So a long axial, uh, field of view PET scanner can help us look at the biology in a deep manner throughout the body or a substantial part of the body. And, you know, in the past, we haven't done that too much because we're doing certain, you know, limited applications. But if we think about building digital twins and doing predictive dosimetry, where we're getting a, a digital twin of the patient that is updated with real time data, right, reflecting their history and current condition of the patient, that can allow us to do simulations, to play with the digital twins, the avatars, uh, and investigate complex treatment planning scenarios, right? So a vision of the future would be that we can do accurate rapid evaluation of different radio pharmaceutical therapy approaches. Like what happens if I inject my patient a little bit different with at a different site or with different intervals, right? So to do that, we need to have deeper understanding of personalized biology for every single patient. And doing dynamic whole body PET imaging, covering majority of the body or a good part of the body and understanding you know, the molecular mechanisms per patient can allow us to do that and help us to build these digital twins. Um, and these digital twins, the nuclear medicine digital twins can aid the physicians in complex decision-making processes. And again, these will be better enabled by long axial field of PET scanners. So to better predict the future, you know, how and where should I inject uh, uh, how much into this patient, that baseline PET scan could be extremely valuable. 
right? So we need to have improved biological models beyond existing kinetic modeling paradigms. Existing kinetic modeling paradigms are retrospective in the sense that they say, give me some data set, I'm gonna tell you what's happening in the body. But if you wanna predict what will happen to the patient if I do something differently, we need a more holistic, um, a more compl you know, complex or more deep understanding of the complex relationships that are happening in the body, right? So let's just talk about for a moment about, forget about the field of imaging and PET imaging, just pharmacokinetics, right? So just drug development in general. So, you know, people in this field often, you know, there's two parts of this, pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics. So pharmacokinetics is what the body does to the drug and pharmacodynamics is what the drug does to the body. Now this part, what the drug does to the body for us would be radiation biophysics. But the pharmacokinetics, there are significant overlaps. We're talking about how a radiopharmaceutical distributes in the body over time, all the way to the tumor and what happens to it, right? Um, so there are different methods to, to deal with these kind of models. And there are so-called top-down approaches, the POP-PK methods, population pharmacokinetic models, and bottom-up methods, so physiologically based pharmacokinetic models. These have been more routine. So these POP-PK models uh, are actually quite similar to our own kinetic models. They're oversimplified. Uh, the, you know, we're, you've done oversimplification. You, sure, you have two, three compartments. The compartments sort of have a meaning, but they're not as meticulous as they, they, they should, right? Uh, whereas these ones have a lot more compartments. Um, and so, so, okay, so let's talk about pop PK models. You may have two compartments. You're not necessarily even doing imaging in their paradigm. So you don't even know what this second compartment's measurements are. So this would be maybe what the, how the radio pharmaceutical distributes in the many organs at the sort of closer to the blood level. And, and this could be, for example, uptake in a tumor, but we're not measuring this in non-imaging scenarios. So already this could be a complex model. And so they're fitting the data, but when you're dealing with physiologically based pharmacokinetic models, you have many organs, you're really having meaning behind all these compartments. They're not oversimplified to just two or three tissue compartments. And you're looking at the, 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 a more holistic picture, but you have so many unknowns. So fitting that is very difficult, right? So that is considered complex, but it is a new thing. It's a new paradigm in, in, in pharmacokinetic uh, modeling. What I wanna emphasize today is, is the following. In the past few decades, you know, more complex models have been tried for PET imaging, but they've kind of been discarded in favor of more oversimplified models. I believe with long axial field of view PET scanners, we are at a, at a position in this, you know, sort of critical uh, moment that we're having ahead of us to revisit kinetic models and to do more advanced, more sophisticated, and, and at the same time, robust kinetic modeling to really understand better at a holistic level, what is happening to each individual patient. Because if we can do that, we can actually anticipate and predict what will happen if we do treatments differently. So I believe kinetic modeling methods have to be advanced and can be advanced. And the vision of this, and sort of this vision of the future has long axial field of view PET scanners at the center of it, or at least a very, you know, uh, is very enthusiastic about it, right? So. So if used with, with their full capabilities combined, combined with either imaging clinical data and aided by AI, sometimes these biological processes could be extremely complicated, but once you build it, AI can replicate them at a faster, computationally faster times, but we do need to go to a deep understanding of the biology and that might allow us to build uh, reliable uh, digital twins for our patients, do predictive dosimetry and to really personalize and optimize the delivery of healthcare to our patients. So the digital twin coupled with appropriate computational, computational tools can be used for predictive dose modeling and just predictive and, and, and optimized delivery of healthcare, as I mentioned. So a model can be personalized, for example, based on pre-therapy imaging, like the pre-therapy PET, maybe combined with other PET scans or SPECT scans um, and different injection strategies uh, coupled with our digital twin, which is having this sophisticated model in it can be explored and experimented with on the, our patient's avatar and then injected into the patient. So corrective strategies can be investigated such as adaptive dose planning, adjuvant therapy, you know, you know systemic chemotherapeutic you know, strategies, et cetera. So as final remarks, long axial field of view PET scanners enable significant overcoming of existing limitations in PET 
And this can be considered an innovation that could change the landscape of medical image in the future. You know, we are in the image wisely era, right? With, with, with appropriate public awareness that unnecessary radiation exposure should not be there. We can now do, let's say, 1,000% reduction in patient radiation doses for, for matched image qualities. But we can do more. We can do more with, it, with you know, so traditional approaches to PET, uh, you know, a, a significant proportion of the valuable data is being lost because our sensitivities have been very small. Um, and so that has limited opportunities in diagnosis in and reducing the information value of clinical exams. And now, you know, we, we could be collecting more. So with, with patients already, you know, uh, receiving a certain uh, tracer, certain radiopharmaceutical at time of injection, we could be collecting a lot more information. Or alternatively, we could be injecting a lot less and obtain similar performance. But also, again, I think we have to think bigger than just increasing patient throughput. We have to think about a vision of the, we have to have a vision of the future where, where in which digital twins will be routinely constructed for our patients, updated constantly, and then utilized for experimentation in the digital realm before we bring it over to, to do optimal delivery of healthcare. So I believe the future is bright because we are imagining it to be bright and there are many, many exciting new uh, uh, venues that need to be explored. Uh, final acknowledgements to many members of our lab who are doing amazing work uh, on different frontiers related to the talk I mentioned to, fantastic colleagues with whom um, I've discussed uh, these themes members of the AI and the symmetry task forces of SNMMI who have informed our thinking about some of these things that we talked about and our funding sources. Thank you very much and have a great day.